You're listening to The Digital Deep Dive, where we tackle the newest trends, strategies, and pain points shaping growth across the digital landscape. From Amazon and D2C to international expansion, join our host and e-commerce leaders across multiple industries for in-depth discussions on how to maximize your brands in the digital arena. Now, here's your host, Aaron Conant. Well, hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Digital Deep Dive podcast. I'm your host, Aaron Conant. And uh, today, I have uh, a new friend, right? I uh, met at an event we did. <laughs> That's right. Uh, out in Denver, uh, John Bousman uh, over at Outward Hound. And just, we had a great conversation and we had a follow-up great conversation. I'm like, hey, why don't we have a bo- conversation on the podcast? <laughs> <laughs> and he said, what was it going to be about? I was like, we'll make it up as we go along. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I think there is like 15 different topics we should have uh, dove into, but um, first I'll kick it over to you. If you want to do a brief intro yourself, uh, your role, um, I don't know, some of your background, if you want to, that'd be cool. And then we'll jump into the conversation. Sound good. Yeah, sounds great. Thanks, Aaron. And it's great to be on the podcast. As you said, my name is John Bowsman, VP of marketing at Outward Hound, which we make uh, dog and cat toys, games, puzzles, beds, and honestly, a great, exciting space to be in. Um, you can find us online and in kind of major retailers. And so I started in this company um, a little over a year and a half ago, and it's kind of been interesting. One of the lessons in my career, too, is you never kind of really know what what you're being prepared for, like as you go along, right, and how some of the things that you do in your career are going to get used. And so my background, uh, I went to a small boutique school in Indiana called Anderson University, and it was so nice. I went there twice, got my MBA, and uh, really loved my time there. Um, it's a fantastic school. And so started in retail and, um, I've been in a lot of different ownership types of businesses in my career. I've been in family owned, privately owned, publicly traded, and then, uh, private equity. So private equity is one that I've had a lot of experience in over the last eight years. And, uh, really kind of my sweet spot has kind of really shifted into, um, uh, multi-channel CPG brands, uh, where I'm able to kind of come in, help build a team, help scale a team in order to actually achieve like revenue. But to be honest, there's a lot of really nice metrics that are fantastic to quote. But for me personally, one of the things that I really love is building teams and investing in people and truly seeing that you kind of have people processes and systems and you have to be able to understand the business in order to understand your team, how they fit in and where that scales. But I love investing in people, which is kind of where we started actually talking about a little bit about Just one of the topics I was talking about recently was someone that may seem very countercultural, but it's one of the things that I've seen in my career that I've seen people get tripped up on and would love to talk more about it with you and um, some of the thoughts on it that hopefully those, at least in our career, uh, whether they're now or kind of younger in nature that are kind of just getting into the career, might be able to hear that and take heart. Yeah. And that, yeah, let's just jump into it because I agree I've got um, an 18-year-old. He's actually going to a small um, school in Indiana called Taylor University. Um, no way. Yeah. That's, uh, that's actually Anderson's arch rival. Um, oh, no kidding. <laughs> yeah, which is really fun. I mean, they're both like really small schools, wonderful schools. I actually looked at Taylor, uh, loved Taylor, went to that uh, campus many, many times growing up. Um, obviously, you guys have gone to Ivanhoe's, right? Yes, you went to of Ivanhoe's? course. Yeah, some yeah, strawberry shortcake, some ice cream, some shakes. Yeah, of course. Absolutely. Yeah. That's too funny when you said it was a small school in Indiana. I was like, I wonder if he's going to say Taylor. And then it was Anderson. I was like, okay. (laughs) Um, And and something that I think we were chatting about was this idea of, you know, the microwave society that we're in right now, that we want the instant gratification. And Mm -hmm. um, I don't think that AI is necessarily all the talk of AI is helping that. I think it is. Right thinking that it's going to solve every problem. And yet yeah. I take it back to my 18 year old. Cause I'm explaining to him that like the only silver bullet is hard work. And mm, absolutely. And those things that you work the hardest for you, seem to be the most fulfilling. So let's make sure that we yeah. keep a focus on a work ethic, which I think is kind of like the thread that we were pulling a little bit. So yeah. I think like, I love just the, you know, to, to hear your thoughts on this, because you talk about building teams and mm-hmm. um, there's this, we sit in a weird spot, this generational gap that's there where you have yeah. the executive and leadership who doesn't, 
in most cases, not in every case, but in most cases, isn't totally digitally inclined. Mm -hmm. And then we've got a younger generation that cannot live without digital. And then we have a gap yep. in between where we can kind of see both ways and we're trying to play mm -hmm. the middleman. Say, hey, yep. we needed to get done, but you can't just do that because we have to consider mm -hmm. this over here. Absolutely. Um, yeah, and that's kind of an interesting place to be in because I think what ends up happening to sitting in the middle, one of the things I've seen is there's this, perhaps the generation that maybe doesn't understand the digital as much or as, isn't as comfortable as much tends to um, be a little bit dismissive sometimes intentionally unintentionally of the younger generation in certain areas uh, because they do have kind of almost a microwave mentality. And at the same time, I think the uh, younger generation isn't as receptive sometimes to that feedback of um, how do I, how do I do this? And I, you know, we would use the term mentorship, right? And um, I think one of the biggest challenges I've seen um, in my career in, building teams is the difference between people that are looking for instant gratification and those that are, are looking for, de, uh, you know, deferred gratification, just this idea of, well, I want it now, right? I want that role now. I want that position now. I want that salary now, that lifestyle now. And the, the hard reality is, is that social media perpetuates this. Right. I mean, you you have so many influencers. I was an OG influencer. I say that because like if you look back at my stuff, you would never know now. Like I totally was like, I'm a I'm an influencer in recovery. I mean, I pulled back, I was like, I want my private life back, I want all that back. But um in a past life, I was an influencer for Columbia Sportswear, uh, the Super Bowl, um, even Broadway across America, which is you know, shows like I'm really into theater, but also the outdoors and two can go together. Uh, just makes for a unique person. Yeah. Um, but, um, all that to be said is, um, there's this reality of not necessarily the idea of like paying your dues, but I mean it more in the sense of, um, learning and being able to put in the time and the hard work, because when you're surrounded by social media and these messages of like, you can get it now. Um, and particularly when people present, like they're getting it now, that's probably not their reality. Right. But then when you have Amazon and other companies that you can get stuff right now. Uh, there's this huge aspect of immediacy. And what I find interesting is I've really started to uh, read a few books of different authors and different perspectives on the idea of um, hustle and rest. And, um, you know, we constantly are hearing about in our, our culture and our work environments that people are, are exhausted, they're overworked, et cetera. And I think that there's a a number of different nuggets there, Aaron. And I think one of them is the idea of like instant gratification versus deferred gratification. And then this idea of rest. And so like, I want to talk about the hustle and rest and how those do go together. Um, and our culture doesn't really kind of picture that, but um, I think that they do and can. Um, but the idea of deferred gratification. So looking at it this way, I had a conversation with someone in my career and they said, hey, I really want to be a, you know, this role. And I said, that's great. That's awesome. Let's talk about how we can help you get there. Like, how can we invest in you? What do you, what's, here's my observation, having been in that role of what's expected and what's required, right? And we ran into it where essentially the person wanted it now. They wanted the role now. They wanted all of that now. And I said, look, I know it may not seem this way to you. Like, I know it doesn't seem this way, but like, I'm actually trying to help you. Like, I know that you want it now, but I'm actually trying to help you. And candidly, if I gave you this right now, if I gave you this right now, you would be set up to fail. You absolutely would. And I'm not saying that because I don't think that you can't get there. You can. But same thing, if you put me in a pool right now and you said, John, you need to go swim five miles because like you're, this is now the expectation. I'm going to fail. Like that I just doesn't matter. Like, I'm just going to fail. Because I haven't trained, I haven't built up to be able to do that. Um, and I said, not only would you fail, but once you get that, it comes with the expectations. It comes with the expectations of performance. That comes with the expectations of knowledge and experience that like you can do these things. And there are going to be jobs that you're not ready for and they're going to stretch you and you can do that. But there's also this gap 
you know, between where you're at and where you need to be able to be. Because if 80% of what's expected of you, you can't do right now, probably not the right, right role for you. And so both as someone that cares about you and wants good things for you, it's actually good for me not to give you that role right now because of all those things. Um, and so it's tough because those are hard conversations. Um, it was a conversation, admittedly, this person didn't like, and ultimately they, they left pretty quickly um, because they wanted it now versus the reality of my company right now is uh, we're private equity owned, multi-channel CPG products, right? And I entered the company in a very interesting, unique time. There's a lot of changes and really had to jump into a team that really needed some stability, some guidance and some vision. We need to implement the right processes and systems and develop a team. And I didn't know it, but years ago, when I worked in a company called Airhead Sports Group, we were private equity owned, multi-channel, CPG, and I entered into some very similar situations. And so those things prepared me to be able to do this role way better than had I not had that experience, right? But if I just walked in and said, I deserve this, I deserve this, I want this title, this responsibility, but I didn't have the experiences to set me up for success and ultimately my team and our CEO, who I, you know, I'm accountable to, then that's, that's actually like not a good thing. Um, and so to, to, you know, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. No, no, I, I just think it, it's, it's just been interesting, you know, the impact like this that the that I think the pandemic had and perpetuated mm -hmm. because in a lot of those situations, and I, I totally agree with you in, on multiple levels, including the fact that if you give somebody that role and maybe it is a, you know, I don't know, a director level or a VP role and you're actually hurting them if the number mm -hmm. one, if they're not ready, number two, if, if it doesn't meet all those responsibilities, because yeah. when somebody comes up, you know, maybe somebody from LinkedIn or a recruiter or somebody everybody wants to grow and move on. Mm -hmm. Well, now you're being ignored because of your title. You're being ignored for yep. ones you're actually a fit for. And then yep. when you actually go in for the interviews for the ones that your title aligns with there, you don't, you don't match up. Right? How many reports yep. did you have? I, I didn't have it. What was, how much, how big was the, the P and L you managed? I didn't manage a P and L. Mm -hmm. So how, how are you a VP? <laughs> it Absolutely. Make sense. But this, 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 so there's a couple of things going on there, right? It's both the skill side as well as the title side. When the, in, when the things don't line up, it's actually not the best. Um, Absolutely. And uh, the other thing is just when I think about the pandemic as a whole, is it got to this point where you know the the lines around anything in the digital space got really blurred because mm -hmm. there were we'll say 1500 people who really knew digital when the pandemic mm -hmm. hit and all of a sudden we needed eight or 9,000. Well, that didn't happen overnight other than right. people just going through updating their LinkedIn profile and putting digital in front of whatever yeah. their title was. And so then we got into this really weird, like two and a half, three years where people, yep. it was free. If, if you were to tell somebody, no, you're not going to mm -hmm. get that, that role. It's not right. You need to stay here and develop more they could easily jump to another company and yep. jump into a role that was higher and not excel, but nobody mm -hmm. knew the difference anyways. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and, then, and then over the past year and a half, what we've seen is people going back and not only like you think about rationalizing your tech stack, they're actually rationalizing the digital talent on their team. Mm -hmm. You are actually yeah. really good you are actually really mediocre. And, mm -hmm. and, and I think what we saw was the people who, you know, kind of stayed in the spot and really got it done and earned the next level. They're yep. sticking around for next time around and the others are not because mm -hmm. they didn't really learn it and they didn't have the chance. Cause if you're not doing this all day, every day, you're falling behind. Like, absolutely, and you, you can't catch up. You can't catch yep. up. It's, it's too hard. It's too hard to catch up. Yeah. Well, you said something there too that I think is really interesting. And, you know, to put it one way, I think it's the idea of staying somewhere long enough to be able to, to solve problems because you're always going to have problems, right? I mean, admittedly, like we're brought in to solve problems. Um, you know, hey, our, our revenue isn't where we want it to be or where it needs to be, right? Or our um, tech stack isn't where we want it to be, but we don't know what that looks like, right? Whatever it may be, like we're brought in to solve problems. And we're always going to have problems. 
So part of it is one, have you been somewhere long enough to solve meaningful problems? And part of that is being able to be there long enough to be able to see, I made this decision and I was able to see it all the way through and see what the results were, right? Because as a marketer, you could be like, well, I came up with this really cool campaign. It was blah, 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 blah. Well, how did it actually perform? I don't know. I wasn't there, right? And the hard part is, is when you see certain people that unfortunately like jump so frequently to be quite candid, like they're pursuing that title or the company or whatever it may be. And there's nothing wrong. You know, there's very legitimate reasons for leaving one company or one job for another, 100%, not discrediting that in any way, shape, or form. Um, but there's a difference between like continually jumping because you want that title or that pay or whatever. Because eventually what happens is you get to a point where you're in a role and the expectations are there, right? Hey, we expect that you have, you know, like experience that you can actually have responsibility of ownership of this, of growing this. And suddenly you're in a role where you have those expectations, but you didn't stay anywhere long enough to get that experience to know how to solve those problems because you were seeking the immediate gratification as opposed to the deferred gratification. And I think that's like a huge one that some people, like you said, you now you're in a hard spot because all the roles that you're going to be applying for have that expectation, but you actually don't have that experience. You just have the titles. Right. And then they're, are you trading down? How does that look on LinkedIn? Right. And then there's yeah. all these other implications. I mean, well, that was, I mean, it was hard for, for hiring managers for a long, I mean, it's still hard now, but it was even harder yeah. because you didn't know. And especially mm-hmm. on HR teams, right. They've never vetted out, you know, a digital content specialist, an SEO yep. person. They haven't. And so mm-hmm. they're now tasked with hiring hiring managers, yep. HR, something they've never had to do before. And yep. you don't know any better. And these people are jumping around and you look at the resume. And again, I, I throw this example out there. You know, a lot of times like in that situation, they would score a 20%, maybe a 10% on the digital yep. excellence quiz. And the person they bring in would score a 40. And they're like, Wow, I'm blown away. This person knows three to four times more than I know. And I'm a smart person. They must yeah. be amazing. And pretty soon you've hired in as somebody who's scoring a D minus, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, yep. You're totally failing the test. And absolutely. Now, what do you do? Now, what do you do? Mm-hmm. And I think that was one of the hardest things around building a team. And I think we're we're turning the corner on that. Yeah. But it was fueled by that. I want this next. And actually I can go get it somewhere. And they did it. Mm -hmm. And again, not to your, at the end game, some people, yes, it worked out, but a lot of people, it didn't. Uh, When you're thinking about like building a team, what did, what Mm. the advice that's out there for for setting it up? Because you did, you know, you outlined a few different parts of it, not just the people, but the systems, the processes Mm -hmm. and all that. Like, would love to know, like, how you think about building a, a, a team. Absolutely. So when I first start, I try to manage expectations ahead of time with CEO board, right? Uh, the ultimate people I'm accountable to for performance. And I want to understand from them, what are your expectations for timelines and certain key deliverables, right? On turning this around. And what does that look like to you, right? Because that's an expectation that I need to manage, right? Whether I agree with what they say or don't, I need to manage that in some way, shape or form. And so what I try to do when I start too is my personal approach is to say, hey, listen, I really want to spend the next month, month and a half just listening. I want to be intentional about spending time with people, asking questions and just getting to know them. And so with my team, what I initially did is I actually scheduled time within the first week with each person. And I let them know, hey, there's no agenda for this. Uh, The second meeting that we have, I do want to know more about like certain things and I'll share with you those questions. But the first one is I just want to actually connect with you and get to know you, right? Uh, This is your time. Uh, This is your time to, to ask me anything, for me to ask you anything, et cetera. And one of the things that is interesting is the value of questions and the importance of questions. And I'll talk more about that in a second when it comes to adding people into your team. But I really try to start with that. 
Um, and so the things that I'm interested in, then when we get to like the second meeting is, Hey, when we get together the second time around, I kind of want to know like really three things. What are you good at? What do you suck at? And what are you interested in? And I said, just so you know, my philosophy in asking this, so you don't feel like you have to like fudge the numbers is my philosophy is I want to play to your strengths, complement your weaknesses, right? And if there are areas that you are interested in that align with the business needs, let's focus on that. Because if I can align your actual interest for growth along with the business, then there's going to be a natural like passion and propulsion that happens there. And so that allows me to better understand, do I have the right people on the right seat on the bus, right? Do they, would they actually be better in a different seat? Maybe a better seat, maybe just something else entirely, right? Um, and what I find interesting is that kind of begins it, but there's a thread when it comes to like adding people that I'll just tell you, this is like how I approach hiring. Um, I didn't experience this personally in my career. I just kind of like makeshift, like stumbled into this, probably honestly stealing from different thoughts of different people. But typically, whenever someone gets past the first round of hiring onto a team, which is uh, for me, our, our HR uh, partner does that, the second interview is with me. And I let them know ahead of time. I say, listen, we're going to have an hour. Half that time is yours. So you can ask me anything you want, but I'm letting you know ahead of time, come prepared to ask questions, right? And I say that because one, most people end up saying like, well, gosh, like interviews work both ways, but most businesses don't do that, right? We say that, but it's kind of like going yeah, to a leadership But at the end, you know? there's three minutes left. Do you have any questions yeah. for me? <laughs> yeah. And you're like, oh. yeah. you know, I had an interview once where someone's like, oh yeah, I, I got a minute. What do you want to know? And I was like, oh my gosh, red flag, right? <laughs> and there's this reality of, I think you learn far more about people by the questions that they do ask and the questions that they don't ask. Because I can ask questions in a 30 minutes of like your skill sets and you could kind of like, you know, you know, wow me, right? But if we get to the next part and you don't answer, ask me a single question about, hey, what's, the, what's, what's your leadership style, right? Or what's your management style? Or, hey, I'm, I'm interested in knowing some of the immediate problems that you're trying to solve, right? where they don't come with any questions. Um, but then there's also the difference between a good question and a bad question. And what I mean by that is like, you're gonna get a classic question about like, what's the work-life balance, right? And Aaron, you're gonna get the same answer everywhere, right? Like, well, you know, it's important, you know, we support family and all these other things, but you know, sometimes things are really busy and we gotta put in the time and blah, blah, blah. That's the same answer anywhere you go. It's not, a, it's not inherently a, a bad intended question. It's just a bad question because it doesn't get you the answer that you're looking for. A better question is to say, when you're on vacation or when you're on time off, do you feel pressure or an expectation to respond to your email? That's a way better question because that truly gets to the question of boundaries, et cetera. So anyway, so I, I do that. And if they move on to the third round is I actually let them know there's going to be a panel. We're actually going to have a, a um, scorecard. And we're going to score your, um, some of your questions based upon a few key areas. It's all in the job description. There's nothing like crazy in there, but we're going to score that. But this is my favorite part. It's going to be broken into three parts, Aaron. First part, we're going to interview you. Second part, you're going to interview us. Ask the panel anything you want. And this is the, my personal favorite part. The third part, I, as the hiring manager, I'm going to walk out of the room. And you can ask my team anything you want. And I want to let you know that I never asked them what was asked. I never want to know what they said. Uh, because the reality is if I'm doing my job, then there is nothing that they would say in there that I wouldn't already know. And I said, and this is the best way that I can allow you to come in eyes wide open because I said, I have strengths and weaknesses both. My team has strengths and weaknesses both. You should know that. You should know that going in. So here's why I talk about like how this helps build the team. The first part was the people of the people that you currently have, right? The second is adding the talent to the team that you need. And here's the benefit. By following this process, one, we've already established mutual trust, right? Between me and the person coming on. They've already established mutual trust with the team. And they've been able to see the culture of the team at large. 
So by the time that we actually get to like the whole offer stage, I tell them on the upfront, like, hey, I'm going to give you the best offer that I possibly can that I think is right. I don't go back and forth. That way you never have to wonder like, was, did I ever get the best deal or whatever? But I always have a conversation before I offer. I say, what's important to you? Like, what's important to you? I had someone legit say like, health insurance is important to me. And I said, okay, well, we're not going to be able to get you onboarded in time. So here's what I suggest. Let's have your start date be this date because then you'll actually have health insurance going into the next month. Um, and so like, I never would have known that had I not asked that. So a lot of that to me is the idea of asking questions and to steal, you know, the whole Stephen Covey begin with the end of mind, but asking questions to understand what's important to people, because now you have a team member that's excited to join. They're not questioning whether they got paid fairly or not. They're joining a team that they already feel confident about. They have trust and rapport built in day one. You've just achieved what most people want to achieve in 90 days, and you did it on day one. So that's my philosophy and how you start building a team, because it's got to start with people. And then you get to the processes and the systems, but the people is the most important part, because that's at the base of the pyramid. Yeah, I mean, it, <laughs> I totally love it. And if you look at the process so many times, it, people just want to fill a position. A body left, I need another body. HR, help me out. Yeah, right. We we've got a a great um, partner, um, Hawkeye Search. They're a, um, you know, basically a, a talent search firm, essentially, right? In the mm. digital, focused yeah. in the digital space. Um, and with the feedback I get over and over again is around them is they put in more time and effort around finding the right people, not mm. just filling a seat. Right. And now they're ahead of time doing a lot That's of that good. screening and everything else, which a lot of HR companies or HR departments need help with. Um, but it's funny because you're you're then putting it so many people then wonder why the team doesn't work or it was dysfunctional. Yeah. Right? It yeah. Is, well, again, uh, you have to put in all the work up front. Because <laughs> mm -hmm. you you know, in, in my idea is. I want to find out if they're going to be happy on the team mm -hmm. and if the team's going to be happy with them. Yeah. Right? And less and more important is the team going to be happy with them. I want them to fit in. But if there is beyond them having the right skill set, are they going to fit in nicely? Right. And do they yeah. even want to, or is this just a job? And, and that's mm -hmm. how can I find that out? And again, yeah. you can't find that out from a pre screen survey, you know, on a job board mm -hmm. and then a matching up you know, on talents and, you know, uh, an hour interview and, you know, this mindset, I just need a body there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Short term, again, gratification is there. It got done, but it stumbles up the long-term goal of growth, which is what a lot of people are looking for right now. Um, yep. Crazy. Wow. It's, it's funny because you were talking about that process when I was back as a project manager. Um, I was interviewing for this project management role and they brought me in and it was a panel interview. And they said, Hey, if everything goes crazy, right? Like three of your projects go completely sideways, timelines pushed out, validation batches fail, you know, all this stuff happens. What do you do? And I was like, I probably grab my golf clubs and just leave for the day. <laughs> I, was like, I was totally honest with him. Like, Yep. If all of that happens, there's no way I can fix it. And I probably just need time by myself. And I don't need to be sitting at a yeah. desk with the phones ringing nonstop. Mm -hmm. I probably just want to yeah. go work through it on, on my own in my head before I came back with a plan. Mm -hmm. And then I That's left good. there and I thought, that's probably the worst answer on the planet. I just said I would <laughs> No, actually, they hired me. They're like, yeah, that's awesome. Nailed it. Like, you're the most honest person around. <laughs> <laughs> and just also the, the, the panel interview what would you do if this happened i would leave and go golfing <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome and then you, i love you, it you, you think about that series of then of life events so then i get to be a project manager and i take on different roles you know and then i get a crazy one to launch a direct consumer site and then an amazon business and then i mean you fast forward you know from that point in time i don't know like 17 years and we're here right uh mm -hmm. it's so interesting the the trajectory of of all of that but that was them in that case trying to figure out am i a right fit 
And I'm trying yeah. to figure out if they're a right fit. And you know what? It worked out. It was cool. That's awesome. I love that story. I love that um, story. <laughs> um, so, I mean, I, I as I'm kind of walking through here, I'm thinking, because this comes up a lot, right? In the executive corporate America, like huge, big corporate America, it is a little bit different because of everything, the, the size of it. But I have this conversation a lot with, you know, the smaller mid-size, um, you know, businesses as a whole is how do you, how do you create a team um, mm. that works? And, you know, you, you have a couple of different, you know, aspects. And one is you're coming into an organization. I think it can be applied even if you're currently there is like, yeah. have that conversation. Like, what are the expectations from the executive mm. team, right? Yep. The PE from what are these expectations? Because I want to build a team that meets that. Yep. If it's straight up growth at all costs, okay, I know how to structure my budget differently and I need to go all in on marketing. Let's go. Yep. Or if it's a profitable growth, okay, well, that's different. Let me take a look at it. And I might be engaged by profitable growth at 10%. Are you just looking at EBITDA? What is it? But mm -hmm. I think you nail it. Like clearly, you know, I think a lot of people go in and they're like, hey, I already know how. I already know how to grow a business, so let's just go. And they take off and they're they're spending money, you know, the growth at all costs, which there's a time for it. But that's not what the executive team wanted at all. And mm -hmm. that's where it kind of diverges. And then, you know, you have turnover. Um, but that was cool. And then the other one is like, what are you thinking about when building a team? Yep. Uh, how do you look at like, like bringing the right, oh, that's how you bring the right people on, but then maintaining I don't know if it's camaraderie. I don't know if it's growth. I don't know if it's the the culture. Uh, what should people be thinking about in that space? And what I really love about this conversation we're having is it doesn't matter if you're um, mid 40s, mid 30s, mid 20s. Yep. Like this is completely applicable to, yep. hey, this is how I should think about doing it. Um, Absolutely. How do you think about like the cultural piece and and maintain it? Because the other thing that happened with COVID was a lot of people went remote. The like, mm -hmm. camaraderie is not there. And like, oh, yeah. no, I talk to them every day over Zoom. You're not eating lunch with them. And there's something about yeah. breaking bread with somebody. They're just a hundred percent, hundred percent. You know, I'm sure that like a number of people would probably give certain criteria, right? Like a, uh, this, 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 which is pretty standard answer. But I'm going to throw out what I think is actually one of the most important ones, if not the most important one uh, to me personally, and I'll explain why, but you don't really hear about. And what I'm typically wanting to look for is shared values, shared values. And what I mean by that is because like, and this is true in our personal lives, right? Like interests can change, things can ebb and flow, right? Um, I have a buddy of mine who, um, when uh, he got married, he he had never he didn't go hunting, he didn't go fishing, right? Um, that interest changed. He's a huge avid hunter, huge avid fisherman. He's got you know this great little cabin that he goes to, et cetera, and, it, and it's a huge interest at the time. So his interest can change, but his values of what he actually values with time with family or whatever has stayed the same. And I think that's true with people in general. I think it's true with teams. So what I mean by that is. When you're looking for values, I, I want to find someone that values hard work. I want to find someone that values honesty. Because the reality is, is that like, I want to know when something's broken. I want to know when I'm messing up. Um, and so I want people that are willing to say that, right? I also want people that value teamwork. That are like, hey, listen, when my team member needs me, like, I want to be a person that shows up. right? I want to be a person that shows up for them. Um, and then, you know, there's a, there's the, also this other area of, I, I want to find some, someone that values the idea of uh, having each other's back. And what I mean by that is uh, there's this wonderful quote, right. Of like, find people that uh, like that speak for you in rooms you're not even in. And it's this idea of, um, supporting one another in teamwork. And so I say all that because like skill sets you can develop and learn. Right. Uh, but these values are going to hold true regardless of the circumstances they're in. And so I think about last year, uh, we were uh, approached a huge project. We called it Project Flash because uh, we were going to go so fast, like the Flash, um, and try to accomplish a ton. 
And there was this reality of like, things were going to break. They absolutely were. There was no way that going into this, we were going in a speed. And part of that was on purpose. We want to see like what was working, what didn't. Because when you go really, really fast, you find out pretty quickly like, oh, this isn't working or this is broken over here. And what I really love about how the team approached that is they supported each other. They were honest with each other. And that people were receptive to that feedback throughout. So you didn't get finger pointing. You didn't get like, oh, you know, Bobby didn't do this or Susie didn't do this. And I say all that because I believe that all of that, this is just one of my personal beliefs. I have have a belief that this phrase is that uh, teams beget the behaviors of their leaders. So teams beget the behaviors of the leaders. So if you find people that have shared values, it becomes very easy to uh, work well together because you don't have to filter it for starters. What I mean by that is getting advice from someone that is a billionaire could be really, really good. Right. But if I'm getting advice from a billionaire who's like, hey, you know, climb the line, do this, do this, cut as many throats as you can to make a buck, that doesn't align with my values. So I have to sift through his feedback pretty heavily to to see are there any nuggets that apply to me. But if someone has more shared values of the idea of like family, hospitality, generosity, right, investing in others and, and, and whatnot. There's shared values there. I'm more apt to be able to receive what they have to say because I don't have to filter it as hard. So you take that and you take it the idea with a team. Well, if I'm exhibiting that then as a leader, if I'm receptive to feedback, if I don't point the finger at anybody, if I generally want to seek to understand, to ask questions, to make sure that they're set up for success, then the team is going to beget the behavior of that leader. You look at sports. I don't, I can't picture a single team where you had an extremely disciplined coach and an undisciplined team. And the inverse is true. I can't think of a team that was super disciplined where you had a lazy coach that wasn't disciplined. So the idea that teams but get the behavior as a leader. So I personally look for shared values because it allows us to move a lot faster because we know where the other person's coming from. There's a more rapport and trust there. Um, and two, I need to exhibit those values, uh, which also means I need to, uh, the last piece I'll say is I need to be open to feedback. I need to be able to consistently ask for feedback. So whenever I meet with, for instance, my boss, every single one-on-one, I always end by saying any feedback for me. Anytime I meet with one of my direct reports, I always ask at the end of the meeting, any feedback for me? Is there anything you need, anything I can help with, and any feedback for me? Because if I'm exhibiting that value of teamwork, supporting one another, hard work, and being open, right? then they're going to exhibit that too. And that just creates an incredibly strong team. And if they don't, then they're probably not going to be on the team eventually. No, I, here's like the, the, the theme that I'm pulling out right now. Then I want to jump it over to you. Just, you can ask me no. any questions you want as well, because I've been picking your brain is, at the end of the day, you as a leader are responsible for mm-hmm. finding out what the goals are, the strategy, how to get it, the people you're hiring that you're putting on the team setting, you know, basically the cultural standard for the team. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and then driving all the results. Yep. So little is about the team, right? It's everything about the team. Right. And Mm -hmm. and I'm a Michigan guy, the team, the team, the team, right. Yep. Yep. (laughs) But the leader, it falls on it. Um, Mm -hmm. It falls on the leader. Um, and they need to be in, in, in a place where they, they accept that responsibility. Yep. Right. And that's, that's tough. Like <laughs> that, that's it. But it all comes back to you. And, and yep. if the team is failing, it might be your fault. It's probably, the 100%. Leadership's fault. it's probably the leadership's fault. Um, absolutely. And that's a lot to, to bear, but it's a lot to remember. Um, right. Yeah, uh, Absolutely. Heavy is the crown, as they say, but it's the idea of, you know, the buck stops with me. And the reality is, is that if something's not working, is your default to assume like, oh, Bobby's lazy or Bobby didn't get done? (laughs) Or is your default to be like, hey, what, what, what do I need to improve upon? Did I maybe not communicate that expectation very well? Do I maybe to me be more consistent and following up and following through? Like start with you. And that doesn't necessarily mean that like, 
you need to own something that's not yours. Like if Bobby's just not doing his job, that's for Bobby to own. But you're accountable for Bobby's performance and you whether you probably it's the right hired thing. Bobby. You probably did. So <laughs> you probably need Bobby to in that, that role. Out. You yeah. put him on his developmental path or not? Uh, yeah, too cool. Like what? I like to throw it over to you. Any any questions? Yeah. I've been picking your brain on this, and it's been Absolutely. absolute blast. Um, any any questions to throw to throw my way? Absolutely. I always like to leave a few minutes at the end for that. Absolutely. So one thing I'm really interested in learning from from your experience, Arian, and also like what you've seen, because you have a lot of engagement interactions with people at different levels. So you obviously mentioned you have Hassan going to Taylor. Woohoo! Um, that's like, super exciting. Um, I'm super curious. I don't I don't have kids. Uh, I would like to. And admittedly, my probably um, you call it work life balance, whatever you want to call it. But my my career, I've worked, 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 worked. And I know that I value family. And so getting married was an adjustment, right? Of hey, I you can't be at the office till 8 p.m. every night. You know, that's just one not healthy long term, but that's not gonna be good for your marriage. Uh, you throw in kids, totally even different ball game, right? And so this might be a big question, it might be a loaded question, but like I'm curious to hear. Is are there any things that you've experienced in your career on how you've been able to either uh, prioritize family and work appropriately or shut off, you know, from work, uh, whatever that looks like, right? In order to be more present with family, or things that you've seen that have helped you be successful. That someone in my boat to learn from and be like, man, that's a that's a good nugget. I need to chew on that nugget right there. Um, yeah, the power of saying no. Mm. power of saying no every time you say yes to something you're saying no to something else Mm. and when you have that mindset like i have to realize if i'm saying yes to this i'm saying no to whatever it is that i would be doing in that time and Mm -hmm. is is it worth it or not um sometimes it is you have a job i have to provide for the family Right. Yep. So sometimes um, there's a dinner to do. You know, we do 100 dinners a year. I don't moderate all of those. I brought in, you know, other digital strategists to help me out with those. Um, but if I have to go, OK, well, can I plan it around where I'm not going to miss something? Or if it does, like, w- w- what is it then? The reality is, mm-hmm. yes, I might miss a volleyball game, but I am providing for the family. Right. The only reason mm-hmm. they can do that. Yeah. But, you have to be very selective. So then I have to start saying no. I have to start mm-hmm. saying no to, you know, I used to play summer softball or, you know, winter pick up basketball, like golf. Like I have to start saying no to other things mm-hmm. because I have to say yes to the family. But those are my priorities, right? So I set yep. my priorities out there. Um, the other thing is just, you know, to focus on fewer things. The one thing, right? It's funny because you, you look back, <laughs> the word priority was only singular up until, I don't know what it was, 50, 60 years ago. <laughs> then it became priorities. Yeah. But priority means the number one thing. There cannot be more than one number one, one thing. Yeah. Yep. And even if you want five, you can only work on one at a time and that becomes the priority. But we mm-hmm. in this crazy society have put on priorities. And so the tough part is just being able to remind yourself to say no, because mm. it's easy for us to say yes, especially when you love what you do. Like I literally, yeah. I totally love what I do. It's, I, yeah. I, I, I could do it forever. It's so much fun. Um, I love people. I love digital. I love helping people out and I love talking about it. And I get to do that all day, every day, um, yeah. which is fantastic. But still, um, I have to say no so that I can say yes to other things that really, really matter. And that's, the power of no, I don't think a lot of people have. And that's where you get in this time of overcommitment. And you get people who talk about how busy they are. You're only as busy as you make yourself. I've got four mm-hmm. kids and a dog, right? And all of them play sports. They have one graduating this year. I've got a full-time job that I have to travel for. Like, I'm busy. Yeah, I'm busy. Yep. But, <laughs> but. You know, uh, I could be even busier, but we're only as busy as we make ourselves. 
Um, that's the real. Um, too cool. Well, I love that. This has been an absolute blast, my friend. Um, yeah, same. Yeah, we'll have to do this one again. Uh, it's too much fun. To. And so glad we got connected. Um, but I see Absolutely. we're pretty much right here at time. Uh, and I like to be respectful of that. And so um, thanks again uh, for the fantastic conversation today. With that, we're going to wrap up this episode of the Digital Deep Dive. Thanks, everybody, for listening in. Thanks, John. Thanks. Thanks.